Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, I'm Jason Freeman, the force behind the Free Library Author Events Office's 50-Year Fall and Ascent, and I'm very excited to be here tonight to introduce Stephen Brill. Uh, in thinking of tonight's topic, I looked back at the words of many American statesmen, but I kept leveling my gaze on two of them, Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt, and I think this was because of the qualities that they shared that I admire uh, in any people, optimism, sense of duty, pragmatism, the sense that we're all in this together, and that a, that a democratic government is bound to the will of the governed. And most of all, I'm drawn to their words because of how timeless they are, and yet how paradoxically antithetical they sometimes seem to our current state. Uh, Teddy said, much has been given us, and we'll and much will rightly be expected from us. We have duties to others and duties to ourselves, and we can shirk neither. And FDR said, human kindness has never weakened the stamina or softened the fiber of a free people. A nation does not have to be cruel to be tough. Vague claims of making America great aside, I think it's pretty hard for a lot of us to imagine these sorts of words being uttered in today's as yet undrained swamp. So how did we get here? Were but there were a writer to show us that not all is lost, to map not only our decline, uh, but our rise again. Uh, someone to highlight the men and women who are at this very moment dragging us back up the mountain. Journalist and lawyer Stephen Brill is the founder of Court TV, 10 regional newspapers, and the American Lawyer Magazine. His 2013 Time Magazine cover story, Bitter Pill, Why Medical Bills Are killing us, won the National Magazine Award for Public Service and became the basis for a New York Times best-selling book. A regular expert analyst for the likes of CNN, NBC, and CBS, he has written for the New Yorker, Time, and the New York Times Magazine, uh, Esquire Fortune, and many others, and somehow he finds time to teach journalism at Yale University. Uh, tonight, Mr. Brill joins us with Tailspin, the people and forces behind America's 50-year fall and those fighting to reverse it. Uh, the title pretty much says it all, but I loved this blurb from the great Jeffrey Tubin. Uh, he put it more eloquently than I could anyway. He says that tailspin is nothing less than a unified and persuasive theory of everything, including politics, business, culture, and it even includes several glimmers of hope amid the pervasive darkness. Here to share with us some of these sorely, sorely needed glimmers, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Brill to the Free Library. Um. As uh, was mentioned, uh, this book really tries to answer a question that I'll bet that most of us in this room, regardless of our political leanings, have been asking ourselves some version of over the last few years, which is, how did we get here? How did the world's greatest democracy and economy become a land of crumbling roads, galloping income inequality, bitter polarization, and dysfunctional government? Well, here's the version of the question that I posed to myself about uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, my wife and I had just arrived at Kennedy Airport from abroad. We had trudged through the crowded and filthy terminal and got into a cab and were stuck on uh, the expressway that goes into Manhattan, which is always clogged, always has potholes, is always under construction, is always ugly. Um, and in the middle of uh, the expressway, it's called uh, the Van Wyck Expressway, for those of you familiar with New York, um, there's a tram. And I looked up at the tram and I kind of laughed the way I always do because the tram is so absurd. It goes, it costs billions of dollars and it goes all the way from Kennedy Airport about eight miles into Jamaica, Queens, not into the central city of Manhattan the way uh, all kinds of high-speed rails do at all the major cities around the world. Um, was that anyone's idea of building an appealing mass transit system for the gateway airport of the greatest country in the world? And as I thought about that, um, I turned to my wife and asked her what she thought a visitor who had never been to America would think of America's gateway city. Excuse me if I keep saying that I'm from New York. You guys probably don't agree. Um, if he or she had arrived where we had just, uh, where we had just arrived in uh, uh, the terminal at JFK, which by the way, there was water leaking from the ceiling, and was now stuck where we were stuck, 
on uh, the Van Wyck Expressway. And then I rattled off a litany of other examples of what I think is the wrong kind of American um, exceptionalism. The sky high cost of health care and public education, but the lousy results that both systems produce. Or the failure of our country, of, of uh, the Congress, to produce a comprehensive budget since 1994, you know, just to take another example. And then I mentioned what seemed like a glaring but seemingly temporary sign of the wrong kind of American exceptionalism. The fact that at that time, uh, there was a guy named Trump leading in the Republican primary polls. So how did this happen to us, I repeated to her. Uh, whereupon she mumbled something about, well, you know, maybe that's a book. Uh, <laughs> as I tried to find the answer over the last two years, I discovered a recurring irony. The core values that make America great began about five decades ago to bring America down. They became the often unintended instruments for splitting the country into two classes, the protected and the unprotected. Uh, the First Amendment, to take one example, and I'll explain a little more of this later. Uh, the First Amendment became a tool for the wealthy to put a thumb on the scales of our democracy. Due process became an instrument to block all types of government activity meant to protect the unprotected, from enforcing job safety rules to maintaining adequate mass transit and passable roads to holding corporate criminals accountable. Reforms meant to enhance democracy actually undercut democracy by making low turnout primary elections the vehicle for choice uh, that parties use to choose their nominees. Classic American ingenuity brought not only life-changing technology breakthroughs, but also trailblazing financial and legal engineering that turned our economy from an engine of long-term growth and shared prosperity into a casino with a few big winners. And as I'll explain, the most ironic of, the, of uh, these boomerangs involved what is perhaps the most apple pie American value of all, uh, meritocracy. So first, let's ask, you know, who are the unprotected that I've been talking about? Well, these are the 99% are the of our country who may be self-reliant and willing to work hard, but who rely on their government to work for the common good, to ensure a decent minimum wage, a fair tax system, and a democracy that gives them an equal voice. They rely on their country to provide a safe and fair workplace, and the job training necessary to participate in a dynamic economy that rightly welcomes technology and, uh, and uh, the globalization that has been going on since the 60s. These, along with access to health care and to public education that is the ticket to equal opportunity, are the common goods that any government is supposed to provide. But the protected, as compared to the unprotected, the protected can buy their own uncommon goods. They can buy private schools, squadrons of lawyers and lobbyists, the best tax planners. They don't need government, and often the government is a threat to them because it taxes them, enforces labor or antitrust laws against them, or otherwise tries to erect guardrails against their conduct that might hurt everyone else. This book explains how that division, that large-scale abandonment of the common good, the division of the protected and the unprotected, how that happened. If you're a Democrat, it explains how we went from JFK to Trump. If you're a Republican, it explains how we went from Eisenhower to, well, Trump. In either case, it uncovers the people and forces that hijack those core values in a way that negatively affects the lives of everyday Americans. Now, I'm not going to try to recap the whole book. It's the most ambitious thing I've ever tried to pull off, and it's not easy to boil down into a short uh, talk. But I will tease you with how two of those core values were turned against the common 
um, against the common good, which suggests uh, some of the ironies and surprises that abound in the story of the tailspin. First, a scene from the book. One day last year, I spent the afternoon in a windowless room in a nondescript small office building about a block from the US Capitol. There, a member of Congress, a smart, decent, and serious-minded person who went into public service for all the right reasons, was sitting at a desk making phone calls as fast as he could. On his desk was a lamp, and on the lamp was a post-it note in his handwriting saying, quote, I don't give a expletive, close quote. The congressman, the expletive was written out. Um, the congressman was dialing uh, donors and begging for money. Why the post-it note, I asked him. Because, he explained, when I am in this room, I must stay focused and go fast. I can't give an expletive. As in, how are you? Oh, your wife died? Oh, that's awful. She was such a wonderful person. I'm really, really sorry, but you know, next month is the end of the quarter, and we really want to file our report showing that we raised lots of money. So I'd really appreciate it if you could max out with a check today. He dials for dollars four to five hours a day every weekday. And every night near the end of each quarter, he goes to fundraiser cocktail parties, taking checks from lobbyists who have organized the events and brought their clients who want access to him. And when I spent one night doing that with him, I couldn't help but thinking, that this could not be what the founding fathers had in mind for Congress. So whose fault is this? Well, it's the work of a young man, now a prominent law professor, who wanted to make a mark as a Harvard Law student in the early 1970s. And his idea for doing that was to write a provocative paper arguing for the first time that corporations had the same First Amendment right to speak as people. It's also the fault of lawyers working for Ralph Nader, who seized on his idea to convince the Supreme Court in 1976 that corporations, in this case, discount pharmacies wanting to advertise their prices, which sounds like a good thing, and is a good thing, that they had corporate First Amendment rights. Now, how the First Amendment then morphed into a weapon that corrupted the political system so completely and that now threatens to derail government regulations of corporate speech meant to protect consumers, such as, ironically, the proper labeling of drugs, is the story of how special interests, the protected, polarized and paralyzed the country in order to dominate our government. Their dominance has been propelled by the shock troops of the new knowledge economy, lawyers and lobbyists. Which brings me to, exec to a second example of a core value that produced unintended consequences, uh, meritocracy. In 1964, I was a kid growing up in Far Rockaway, a working class section of Queens. Uh, one day, I read a biography of John F. Kennedy, and it said that he had gone to something called a prep school named Choate. Now, none of my teachers at Junior High School 198 had a clue what that meant, but I soon figured out that prep school was like college. You got to go to classes and live on campus, only you got to go four years earlier, which seemed like a really good idea to me. The idea soon, soon seemed better because I discovered that some prep schools were starting to offer financial aid. I ended up at Deerfield in Western Massachusetts where the headmaster told my worried parents who ran a perpetually struggling liquor store that his financial aid policy was that they should send him a check every year for whatever they could afford. Four years later, in 1967, I found myself sitting in that headmaster's office one afternoon in the fall of my senior year. He had given it over to a man named R. Inslee Clark, the Dean of Admissions at Yale College. Clark looked over my record and asked me a bunch of questions, most of which, oddly, were about where I had grown up and how I had ended up at Deerfield. 
he seemed intrigued by my JFK Choate story and not knowing what a prep school was. Then he paused, looked me in the eye, and asked if I really wanted to go to Yale, if Yale was my first choice. When I said yes, he said in an instant, then I can promise you that you are in, and I'll tell the headmaster that you don't have to apply anywhere else, just kind of uh, you know, try to keep it to yourself. What I didn't know then was that I was part of a revolution being led by Clark, whose nickname was Inky. I was about to become one of what, co one of what would come to be known as Inky's boys and later girls. We were part of a meritocracy revolution that flourished at Yale and other elite education institutions, then law firms and investment banks in the 1960s and 1970s. Now, it was a great thing for me and for so many other people, including my wife, who was one of Inky's girls. But it turns out that it had a downside. At a Yale Law School graduation three years ago, a professor who had been chosen by the graduating class to be their speaker described the meritocracy revolution that Clark had ignited 48 years before. But then he completely bummed out his audience with this sobering message. Because elites could now spend what they need to in order to send their children to the best schools and provide tutors for standardized testing and otherwise ensure that their kids can outcompete their peers to secure the same spots at the top that their parents achieved, economic diversity at elite schools is, was now, if anything, worse than it was, worse than it was uh, three or four decades ago. He used lots of numbers to back that up, as do I in my book. Although it was once the engine of American social mobility, he said, Meritocracy today has become precisely what, is, uh, precisely what it was invented to combat, a mechanism for the dynastic transmission of wealth and privilege across the generations. Meritocracy now constitutes, he said, a modern day aristocracy, built for a world in which the greatest source of wealth is not land or factories, but human capital, the free labor of skilled workers. These skilled workers, those who won the meritocracy race, became the knowledge worker generation. They were legal engineers inventing tender offers and corporate takeover fights. They were lawyers insisting on an absurdly expanded version of, an, of um, another great American value, due process, which they used to block regulations or turn them into decades-long drafting battles, ending in thousands of pages of detail whose meaning could then be debated by the same lawyers through more due process. They blocked labor law enforcement and created arbitration clauses to keep everyday Americans out of court if they had a consumer or employment discrimination claim. Now, in the book, I fess up to having had a role in boosting the lawyer meritocracy by taking a lead in cheerleading the success and the riches of these legal engineers. In 1979, I started a magazine called The American Lawyer, which focused on the business of law firms. Now, I thought of these firms as big, powerful businesses with intriguing questions lurking behind their uniformly elegant uh, reception areas. Which ones were the best managed? Which offered the most opportunities to women or minorities? Which were more likely to promote associates to partnership because they were economically healthy? Which had the fairest or most generous uh, system of awarding uh, bonuses to young associates? And yes, which had the most interesting clients and a client base that provided the highest profits for its partners. That last question resulted in the American lawyer launching a special issue every summer, beginning in 1985, in which we deployed reporters to pierce the secrecy of these private partnerships so that the magazine could rank the average profit per partner taken home by the partners at the largest firms. 
When this first uh, survey was published, I received a call from a former Yale Law School classmate of mine who practiced at a large and successful Los Angeles firm. He was outraged. He explained that he and his wife had now found out that another classmate of ours who worked at another seemingly fungible LA firm made about 25% more than he did. Until then, he and his wife had been perfectly happy with his six-figure income. Not anymore. Now sure, this flow of market information about these businesses made those who ran them uh, more accountable to their partners, their employees, and their clients. And I should add, much more eager to find places for people who, who had the most talent, regardless of their race, religion, or gender. But it also transformed the practice of law by the country's most talented lawyers in ways that had significant drawbacks. The emphasis was now fully on serving those clients who could pay the most with pro bono work, professionalism, and collegiality, often taking a back seat. And with the emphasis on talent, on recruiting those who had won the meritocracy race rather than members of the old boys network, the big firms were now much fairer, but also much more able to serve and defend those clients. Others, including lots of lawyers, became uh, the financial engineers that we all know about at investment banks. They spun out trailblazing inventions meant to boost short-term gains in stocks, like stock buybacks, uh, derivatives, uh, CDSs, mortgage-backed securities, while hollowing out the long-term economy on which the middle class depends. Breakthroughs in technology enabled automation and globalization, which added to the disruption of the economic security of the middle class. In 1971, a young Richard Nixon aide in the White House named Peter Peterson, and yes, that's the Pete Peterson who founded uh, Blackstone, warned Nixon and his cabinet in a long memo that drastic improvements in job training and retraining programs were needed to enable that middle class to survive in the new coming automated globalized economy. He was ignored. In fact, the 50-year failure of a program called the Trade Adjustment Assistance Act, which was supposed to provide job retraining and was pushed by President Kennedy in 1962, was also ignored. Searching archives for the 55 years that followed, I found just two news articles in the press about how that program worked and didn't work. So, let's look at today. When we look at today, should the frustration of the country over how the winners in the meritocracy have played such a massive role in keeping government from delivering common goods really be a surprise? The frustrated, disillusioned Americans who voted for President Trump, all 46% of them, actually committed the ultimate act of rejecting uh, the meritocrats who were epitomized by the hardworking, always prepared, Yale law educated, but seemingly cold and calculating Hillary Clinton. They rejected her in favor of the opposite, an inexperienced, never prepared, six-time bankrupted, vulgar, shoot-from-the-hip heir to a middling real estate fortune. As I said, lots of other people and forces are part of this same unhappy, slow-motion 50-year story, which also includes, for example, breakthroughs in media technology, which democratized media, but also undermined uh, the journalism profession and exacerbated uh, the polarization that now grips this country. Well, that's the story of the tailspin. But having said all that, I also have to say that in doing this book and in writing this book, I saw something else too. In fact, this turns out to be a shockingly hopeful book. In every area that America has fallen, I saw people who were working and working effectively to reverse the fall. I saw a young Iraqi war vet and Harvard grad 
who has created a program at a converted zipper factory in Queens that trains waitresses, bar bouncers, and sales clerks to become software coders. They join the program, which is free, with average incomes of $18,000 and are placed 11 months later in jobs averaging $85,000. And this guy has even figured out a way to make the program self-sustaining and scalable. I discovered that the Aspen Institute has a project in New York that has recruited a growing group of business leaders to fight the corporate short-termism that has so undermined our economy and so eliminated opportunity for people in the middle. I watched two groups in Washington, Open Secrets and Issue One, work to stir up much justified public disgust with how money has come to dominate politics and channel their work into a growing movement for real reform. I saw how leaders at uh, Baruch College in Manhattan and Amherst College, to take two examples, have put Yale and Harvard to shame when it comes to achieving real economic uh, diversity. Others, such as the Bipartisan Policy Center and the Partnership for Public Service, both in Washington, have created blueprints for real solutions to our problems and real ways to change the way our government operates. And I discovered that Peter Edelman, who is America's leading anti-poverty policy thinker, has put together a detailed plan for uniting the cause of the poor with that of the working class by creating an entirely new employment infrastructure blueprint. His idea, create millions of good paying jobs while serving a looming demographic crisis by hiring and training well paid elder caregivers and preschool child care educators. Now, are these people whistling in the wind? You know, are they just naive? Well, I thought so until I looked at their resumes and more important until I poured through their work. They are anything but naive. They are doing what they do despite developments in America that seem to be galloping in the opposite direction, not because they are gluttons for frustration, but because they believe that America can be put back on the right course. And I think they're right. I think when Americans realize that someone who used their frustration to scam them is not the answer, they will turn to leaders who are prepared, intelligent, sincere, and able to unite them rather than play them. I believe that these new achievers who are fighting the tailspin on all fronts are laying the groundwork for disgust to be channeled into a restoration. In 2018, these people give new meaning to the word, uh, to the word uh, resilience. They make me believe in our country's resilience. There is nothing wrong with the core values that brought the tailspin. They just need to be redirected back to the common good. And that's the message that I hope this book conveys. Thank you. Your, your reference to the college admissions system uh, got my attention. Uh, I think your Time article cited the statistic of something like 49% uh, minorities uh, at Princeton, for example. I don't uh, think I use that statistic, and I don't uh, know that to be well, the case. It, if you look at the elite colleges um, over the last 20 years, the makeup of, of the students, it has changed dramatically. I wouldn't confuse minorities with economic diversity. Both. They're the first generation is getting uh, just as much attention as minorities. Sorry, that's just wrong. That's just totally wrong. Well, I guess I'm <laughs> misled then by uh, people I know who work at Ivy League schools. That would make a lot of sense, because if you ask them, they do tell you that. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm very friendly with everybody at Yale, including the president of the university. Um, I teach at Yale. I've been a prominent donor to Yale. And that was a, you have just, in so many words, you've paraphrased 
the first thing he said to me when I asked him about that. It's good to hear all the positive things that individuals are doing, but can that overcome the impact of Citizens United, which you said is such a major detriment to a real good country? Well, two things about Citizens United. First of all, it's worse than you think. The, um, the Constitution, I mean, I think Citizens United was decided absolutely correctly under the Constitution. Now, the justices were so eager to do what they did that they veered out of their way and made it a much broader decision than it needed to be. But um, what Citizens United was, was a media company. They were making a documentary you know, that attacked Hillary Clinton that in the, in the eyes of the law, that's no different than MSNBC. Now, having said that, Therefore, what I say in the book is the only real answer to Citizens United, which, by the way, has nothing to do you know, uh, with Tom Steyer you know, putting hundreds of millions of dollars into the election or you know, the Koch brothers doing it on a personal basis. So Citizens United has nothing to do with individuals contributing. I think the only way to solve this problem is the more you know, far-fetched uh, solution, which is a constitutional amendment that says that Congress shall be empowered to put limits on how much a candidate can spend and on how much people or corporations or anybody can spend to support the election of a federal candidate. I actually think, this is gonna sound crazy, I actually think that that is um, more likely than most people think because I think people are so disgusted by money in politics that if the right political leaders you know, come forward and suggest that, and fight for that, that it will happen. And so my answer to you is that it, uh, the problem is actually worse than you think because it so dominates everything. You know, the reason our healthcare system is the way it is is because of all the political money. The reason that Obamacare did great work in extending more coverage uh, by way of uh, you know, a health care, um, a subsidy for health insurance, the reason it passed was only because it also enhanced the fortunes of the health care industry by having the federal government able to subsidize insurance so that insurance companies could buy drugs and hospital services and medical devices at the same rip-off prices that everybody else now has to pay for them. So everything is dominated by money, you know, including that poor congressman's, you know, work day. Yeah, I've read that you've started a startup about fake news right. and that, that you um, have some ideas about rating organizations. And I wonder if you could describe a little bit about your effort and also what you felt when Facebook came out with a sort of a similar idea. No, it's not a similar idea. Um, what we are doing, I've, I've started a new company. I can't resist starting companies. Um, uh, we are operating on the premise that every once in a while human intelligence is better than the artificial kind. Um, and we're hiring uh, several dozen uh, journalists who are going to, who are reading and rating the 6,000 or so news and information sites in the English language in the United States. We're starting in the United States and giving them a red or a green icon label and if you click on the label, you read a three or four hundred word description of uh, who's behind the site, what they do, what their standards are, why they got their green or why they got their red based on nine very specific measures that we take. And the whole thing is totally transparent. Um, even the two journalists, it's going to be two journalists, you know, plus the supervisors, plus me who are responsible for all this. Our bios are going to be there. You'll be able to see everything you know, which is the opposite of an algorithm. Um, and the notion is that um, the social media platform, uh, uh, the social media providers, the search platforms will license that from us so that when you get um, a tweet or a Facebook feed that has, a, that has a headline on it from a news article, you'll be able to see how we rated that site. We achieve scale by rating sites, not individual articles, because uh, that's the only way you can do that. So it doesn't solve the problem of, you know, the inquirer running an inaccurate story. It does solve the issue of, 
you know, is the Enquirer a real newspaper, which, you know, so far I guess it still is. Um, <laughs> So uh, that's what it's all about, and we're s almost completing the hiring process, but we're still looking for, uh, for more people. We will make a browser plug-in version available for free through libraries like this one, and also to individual uh, you know, consumers who go to our website so that they can download the plug-in version and get all those ratings and all that information on their laptops if they want it. But you know, as you probably know, uh, you can't do that for mobile, so our business model is that the platforms, the search engines, um, and lots of other aggregators will license the data from us. And it'll cost them a fraction of what they're paying their lawyers and their lobbyists to explain how hard the problem is to solve. What, what in your opinion, was the fertile ground that existed in America 50 years ago that allowed a tailspin to begin? Well, that's the interesting thing. What I, uh, what I say in the book is this, uh, uh, well, first, when I started out, I had no idea. I just, I literally asked that question, how did this happen to us? And as I started to think about all the different spheres, I kept, the one thing I saw in common was, you know, basically, we just got too good at everything we were doing. The lawyers got really smart. The bankers, you know, they, you know, they invented, you know, a, a a derivative, and the initial derivative they invented was a really good thing because it expanded the mortgage pool, and more middle class people had access to mortgages. Rates were down, that was good. But then they just kept making it better and better, and more complicated and riskier and riskier. And you saw the same thing with, uh, you know, legal strategies for corporate. Uh, you know, acquisitions. And what I realized was that um, the basic challenge of a country, you know, of any community, is how do you balance um, the need in a vital um, economy and a vital country to allow people to achieve and compete with each other against the, uh, the goals of um, equality inherent in a democracy? And that's always the tension. And what happened was we just lost it. We, we lost that balance because the achievers got too good at what they were doing. I think you could argue that we, we, we had something like that in 1928, 1929, and then the whole thing just snapped and there was reform. You know, the kind, there's a history of you know, the pendulum uh, you know, swinging back and forth. What was really interesting though, that the pendulum in terms of you know liberal or conservative uh, you know policies and politics, really hasn't swung back um, because you know you would have thought after you know after Watergate and Nixon, uh, the Democrats have the White House, they have Congress, but by then the Democrats in Congress have discovered that uh, you know money is actually a really good thing, and the Republicans are raising a lot of it, so. The Democrats couldn't get, um, you know, labor law reform passed. You know, you had the J.P. Stevens fight, which was like, you know, a poster boy for, let's change the NLRB rules so that you know corporations are deterred from violating the law. I spend a fair amount of time in the book, um, re uh, re reporting a long piece that I did in the American Lawyer years ago about how basically. Um, the J.P. Stevens legal strategy was, we're just not going to obey the law at all. And they had six, seven, eight injunctions issued you know, by a string of federal courts, including judges who were Eisenhower appointees. And they just paid the fines because it cost them so much less than uh, complying with the law. So you know, there was a groundswell, let's have you know, reforms of the NLRB, let's raise the fines, let's speed up the process, all that stuff. And the Democrats couldn't even pass it. Um, you know, Carter wanted to do something about the capital gains tax preference. And so he presented a major tax reform bill, you know, that would, you know, on you know, the liberal side of tax reform. And by the time it got out of Congress, again, a democratically controlled Congress, um, nothing had been done except that the capital gains preference was actually increased. And the only taxes that were changed was 
the social security tax on low-income people was raised and uh, the tax on the highest earners was lowered. The whole thing was just flipped and reversed with the Democratic Congress. So the question that I pose at the end of the book is, are things going to snap back? Are people going to be so disgusted? And um, toward the end of my reporting process, I talked uh, to Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist, and he was describing for me, you know, the effects of you know global trade. You know, um, he said something like, you know, if you add a billion workers who work with their hands to the economy, by which he meant if you open up, you know, the economy to a worldwide economy, that's obviously going to affect the wages, uh, the wages that workers can get in the United States. So I looked at him and said, well, you know, when are things going to change? And he said, well, I have a theory that things are going to get so bad that they're going to get good. And that's kind of the theory that I pose at the end of the book, that in so many arenas, I mean, how long will it be uh, for the country to tolerate um, you know, Social Security, you know, consumer hotlines where nobody ever answers the phone? Or the fact that there's a, like a two-year waiting list if your disability claim has been uh, denied? Or how long will people tolerate the airports the way they are? Or how long will people tolerate that there are 657 water main breaks a day in the United States? At some point, if the right political leaders come forward and say this is not about liberals and conservatives, it's not about Democrats and Republicans, it's about the protected versus the unprotected, um, I think that can change. Uh, the last politician, uh, for my money, who actually did that uh, was Bobby Kennedy, who, where, you know, he didn't turn the middle class against the poor or vice versa. He explained that they were in the same boat. They're much more in the same boat today because the middle class has been so whittled down that, you know, when you read about, uh, you know, the food stamp program, the Republicans want to and want to cut the food stamp program and say, well, there they are going after poor people again. They're going after the middle class. The food stamp program is a middle class program. More middle class people than poor by far in the food stamp program. Because, you know, at the minimum wage we have in this country, uh, you more than qualify for food stamps. You know, most of the people who are on food stamps either are, you know, legitimately disabled or they work. Most of that group actually, ha they have jobs. So uh, the poor and the middle class today have much, much more in common than, uh, than they have that you know, uh, divides them. But we had a politician who basically you know, played the script that you know, the reason, if you're a coal miner, the reason you don't have a job is because of these horrible environmental laws and plus you know, all these immigrants. Well, now that we have the president we have, and he's taking care of those environmental you know, problems, you know, with Scott Pruitt, and he's, you know, he's putting his wall up and he's doing everything he can, guess what? Those coal miners in Kentucky and West Virginia, I think they're gonna figure out within a year or two that they still don't have their jobs. I mean, that is not a hard thing to figure out. I have my job or I don't have my job. And he didn't give me my job back the way he promised. So that's how I think things will change. I think an assumption is that people are voting in their own economic interest, but to the extent people are voting on social interests instead of their own economic interests, that would play against what you're saying. Well, you know, by social interests, you mean the kinds of social issues. You know, one issue voters, um, you know, there are, you know, abortion, you could probably say that the, the, on the abortion debate, I mean, I've never looked at, um, at data on this, so I probably shouldn't say it, but my guess is that there are the same number of one issue of voters who are pro-choice and who are anti-choice. I never like using the word pro-life because I assume actually most people who are pro-choice you know, kind of like life too. Um, but the other issues, I think that's right, but, the, but, but a, a, you know, an effective politician can 
break down uh, those divisions. I mean, for example, there's a page in the book that talks about how um, the, in 2015 or 16, um, the Obama administration wrote regulations that would ban the sale of armor-piercing bullets, except to law enforcement. You all know what an armor-piercing bullet is, right? It goes through bulletproof vests. So the gun owners of America, the NRA went nuts, but the people who really went nuts was the private equity firm that is the leading, that owns the leading company making armor-piercing uh, bullets. And they buried Congress with letters saying, this infringes on the rights of hunters. <laughs> and as I say in the book, I mean, I mean, how many deer or other prey wear bulletproof vests? I mean, what is that about? It, that is a direct attack on the safety of law enforcement officers. That is all it is, right? I mean, we don't go around wearing bulletproof vests. That's what police do. And you know, that's what members of the armed forces do. The idea that you can't even get a regulation like that through, I think that's unsustainable, and I blame, you know, the politicians, you know, our uh, political leaders, who don't have the gumption and also the ability to communicate that. I mean, what could be easier to communicate than why are you getting, you know, why are you allowing the just flagrant sale of bullets, the only purpose of which is to go through a cop's bulletproof vest? That's a you know, that seems like a divisive issue, it's a gun control issue, but I just turned it into something that doesn't seem quite that divisive. The, uh, again, I'm going to be called a conspiracy theorist. I like to say, well, sometimes there are conspiracies. And there was the very interesting group that started in 1948, consisting of Chicago economists and Austrian economists who were very, very pro-free market. Right. And who helped to undo uh, both uh, with, with their uh, ideas and, and with their actions. Yeah, Michael Jensen's of one of the kind of the, mini yes. villains in this book. Yeah. There's a so, whole section about it. Uh, and of course, uh, Buchan James Buchanan and a number of economists uh, had a lot to uh -huh. do with it. So I just want to bring that up, that it's, it's, it's not just a, a power, it, it's, it's ideas that matter here very much and seem to have... Well, uh, yes, in, in the 70s and then through the early 80s, um, a, you know, the Chicago School idea, which for the purposes of this discussion, boils down to the notion that um, the way businesses ought to be run is solely in the interest of the shareholders. Now that sounds perfect. Who could actually be against that, right? And shareholders ought to have the right to um, vote out management if they don't deliver each quarter the right return. Um, and the way to do that, the way to incent the executives, the way to incent the CEO is to have most of the CEO's compensation be based on stock options or other ways to award the CEO every quarter or every year for the increase in the share price. What's wrong with that, right? Well, if you're the CEO and you think, well, you know, I've got another two, you know, maybe two years on the job, um, I'll do anything I can to increase the earnings that quarter because the, the price of the stock is based on a multiple of the earnings and I'll think in the short term because my compensation is in the short term. And what you have is a trend in this country now going 40 years of disinvestment by corporations. Um, you know, some of them, it all made sense. They, got leaner and more efficient, that's all good, but the best example of disinvestment is stock buybacks, which I finger in this book as, as a great uh, villain in terms of what's happened to our economy and what's happened to a sense that you know we share our prosperity. What a stock buyback means is, and this is something that the Reagan administration put through in 1982. Uh, before that, the SEC didn't like stock buybacks. What stock buybacks are is the company votes to buy back its shares on the stock exchange. And there was a fear that executives would use it to manipulate the price of the stock, which of course is what they did. Because if you have 100 shares of stock outstanding and the company you know, makes $1,000, uh, the earnings you know, per share are $10. 
if the company still makes $1,000, but you've bought back 20 of those 100 shares, you now have you know, $1,000 you know, divided by 80, not by 100, so the earnings per share go up. And that's what they did. But if you think about it, it's, sort of, it's the opposite of an investment. You're disinvesting. So you have to cut back on research and development. You cut back on wages. But it also drives the CEO's earnings way up, which explains the fact that in the 70s, the, um, the gap, I'm going to get these numbers wrong, but they're right in the book. Uh, the gap between the average worker and the CEO of a company was 30 or 40 to 1, and it's now four or 500 to 1. 900 and 700. I told you I'd get the numbers wrong. They're right in the book, but it's ridiculous. So um, that was part of uh, the Chicago school whose you know, core value or precept was earnings per share are what the management ought to worry about. And that's how the management ought to be paid. And believe me, they figured out how to be paid that way. You have another book. It's called America's Most Highly Regarded Lawbreaker. No, it wasn't a book. It was a, it was a series of magazines on Huffington of Post. Of which you're a star, but you've got to ask a question, not make a statement. Yeah, and the, and the, the point of the book is a story, a wonderful story about a little boy, autistic boy from rural Alabama. And the most highly regarded lawbreaker you're did an excellent job of describing it is Alex Gorsky, the CEO of Johnson & Johnson. Alex comes from, graduated from Penn. Trump graduated from Penn. You talk about moats in your new book. Well, Alex got which in on I the think merits, is great. and Trump got in because his father gave a lot of money to Fordham, where he started out, then right. his father gave a lot of money to Penn. And that's how he transferred well, let to me Penn. just. But the question comes the question? down to what can we, what are you going to be able, what's your answer about what to do about the Alex Gorskys and the Trumps of the world in the near future? Do we have to wait till the country rises up? Well, let me try to, uh, let me try to summarize the problem first. Um, the irony, one of the other ironies in the book is, uh, remember how I said how corporations persuaded the courts and the legal system to treat them like people when it comes to being able to speak, right? Well, at the same time that's been going on, the CEOs of corporations have persuaded uh, the legal system to treat them like corporations and not people when it comes to their own personal misconduct. So um, what has happened repeatedly, it happened with you know the banks in the crash, it happened with uh, the drug companies, um, you know, uh, most of which pled guilty to the crime of, quote, mislabeling drugs, meaning they were, uh, they were marketing them to people like, you know, children and the elderly who the FDA said you cannot market these drugs to these people, but they did it anyway. They pled guilty, but they didn't plead guilty. The corporation did. You know, the corporate seal pled guilty. And um, one of the really interesting things about the Johnson & Johnson case, which is in the book, by the way, you'll like this section of the book, um, is that here was a case where it turns out the CEO um, was in charge of marketing the drug that Johnson & Johnson pled guilty to illegal marketing. Um, he had worked his way up the ranks, but during the time that the criminal conduct occurred, and I'm not charging the criminal conduct. I'm telling you what the company admitted to. Um, during the time that it happened, he was the guy in charge of the sales and marketing of that drug. And yet, even in that case, when I asked the prosecutors here in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Philadelphia, I said, well, isn't, uh, you know, Gorst, because uh, by then he was the CEO of the company when they did the plea bargain and paid a $2.3 billion fine. Is that what it was? Yeah. Um, and I asked uh, uh, the U.S. attorney and his assistants who had brought this case, and like all the other cases, they were very proud of the two-plus billion dollar fine they got. And Eric Holder had a press conference and said, these people you know, maliciously and cruelly endangered the lives of the elderly and children, and this is horrible. And I said, well, 
in this case, you actually had the CEO because he was the guy who did this stuff that you, you know that they just put guilty to, and they looked at me like I was a Martian. They said, "Well, you know, we got a 2.3 billion dollar fine, which, by the way, in Johnson and Johnson's, you know, is almost a rounding error. You can't find a stock analyst who even remembers that as a significant event that year in Johnson and Johnson's, you know, uh, uh, year." Um, and you know the stock kept going up, it's, and I said you had a guy who did it, and you know I believe firmly that people ought to be responsible, and the only way to deter that kind of conduct is by holding people personally responsible. Now the prosecutors, the typical thing they say is, well you can't get the CEO because how's he supposed to know about all this stuff? So that's that's what they said about all the banks. Who you know? Who paid you know humongous fines after the crash? Well, you know we can't you know the you know J.P. Morgan Chase or Citi they're so big. How is the CEO or the you know the board supposed to know what's going on in these offices around there? That's first of all a good argument for saying well if it's too big to manage, maybe it shouldn't be that big. So then you could hold people responsible, but. In this case, the Johnson Johnson case, what was so unusual about it and what to me proved the kind of perverse mindset that had set in was they actually had the guy who did it. I mean, they had his name was on emails. They had him and they still, they never even discussed whether uh, they were gonna charge him. Um, and that's a problem. Our corporations have become so big that uh, you know people you know, the people at the top can say, well, how was I supposed to know that? Our political discourse seems to have been drained from any sense of civility. How do you restore that sense of civility to our political discourse? Well, we could start with civil politicians. Um, <laughs> and, and I think people have to demand more of their politicians. I mean, one of the problems is that, you know, we all rubberneck at traffic accidents, right? You're on the highway, you see an accident, and you know you're not supposed to rubberneck because it causes traffic behind you. It's not a nice thing to do. Look at people who've you know, been in a car crash, that's not nice, but we do it. By the same token, we all tend to rubberneck you know, when Trump is giving a live speech, or at least the, the cable networks think we do enough so that they think if they stay on them, their ratings are going to be higher than if they don't, because you know who knows what he's going to say, right? Um, I think we have to develop as consumers a different standard, uh, because that's how the media will respond. But that's a hard thing. What I'm hoping for is that the right kinds of political leaders will emerge this time around, who are such a contrast to him, and you know Americans tend to like to change the channel after a while. You know, Trump was certainly a contrast with Obama and just in terms of everything, right? Um, and, you know, I think we may, look, you know, the country may look at that contrast again. What I'm hoping for and counting on again is that the people who were scammed by him, people, you know, you know middle class workers who depend on food stamps, who depended on, you know, regulations to deal you know, with payday lenders who depend on food stamps, who depend on the enforcement of job safety laws and, and labor laws, that uh, enough political leadership can emerge to explain to them what they kind of already are starting to know, which is you know, he may sound good and he may reflect your frustrations, and we understand that, but you know, he's taking advantage of you. He, you. You are no different from the people who enrolled in Trump University. And uh, which is to say, we understand why you enrolled. The pitch was really persuasive, and the promise that you were going to get rich in real estate was really persuasive. The direct mail pieces he sent out, I wrote the first big piece on Trump University. The direct mail pieces that he sent out were targeted to a certain demographic, people who were old and poor. And the first sentence said, do you want to spend your final years as a greeter at Walmarts? And it had a picture of a Walmart greeter. And the alternative was that 
by coming and, and learning from the finest real estate investors on the planet, you too could be rich like Donald Trump. And I think people, you know, those people realized it didn't work. They, you know, they brought a class action suit. Um, you know, maybe the country will, you know, bring its own version of a class action suit. Thank you all. <laughs>